This is the current federal tax developments for the week of July the 5th, 2022. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state Society of CPAs. I'm Ed Zollers, and we're going to talk this week about a few things that have happened here in the area of federal taxes. We're going to begin with a release from the National Taxpayer Advocate Service that indicates they are now going to begin accepting and have begun accepting referrals on 2021 and earlier original and amended returns from congressional offices. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means, how it's a good signal of sorts, but maybe not great about where the IRS is getting to in terms of processing things. But we'll talk a bit about that. We're going to take a look at something we don't usually look at. This was an appeal of a criminal tax conviction of a uh, car dealer. But why we want to look at it is because one of the arguments presented by the dealer about why he shouldn't be uh, deemed to have basically ended up having attempted to prepare returns that were fraudulent is that his claim was that, in fact, the amounts he had omitted from income were not truly taxable. And so we'll take a look a little bit about his theory about why they weren't taxable uh, and also why that doesn't work. And more importantly, why even if it had worked, it still wouldn't have helped him uh, because of a little bit he had with inconsistency, shall we say, about how he applied this supposed rule. And finally, we're going to take a look at the Fifth Circuit, which sustains the decision of a case we talked about a number of years ago when it was at the trial court level. It took a while for this thing to come through all the way to a Fifth Circuit decision. But it's interesting because it's another discussion of what happens with charitable contributions when you end up not following all the rules, and in this case, the Fifth Circuit reminds us that if the ruling question is one that Congress has written into the statute, that, at least to the Fifth Circuit, and they actually cite a case from the Ninth Circuit for the same proposition, that substantial compliance cannot work for you when you fail to comply with a statutory requirement. In essence, while the courts or the IRS could overlook a failure to perfectly comply with a regulatory issue, they aren't able to override the Congress. And so that becomes one of our key issues here. Let's start out with that release from the National Taxpayer Advocates Office. And this is titled Interim Guidance on Changes to TAS Case Acceptance Criteria, a Memorandum for Taxpayer Advocate Service Employees, that was issued on June the 27th. And this particular memo is actually not very long, but it deals with something that's been a problem. As you may recall, the National Taxpayer Advocates Office announced a while back that they were not getting involved in any potential claims, uh, unless there was some other issue involved, of taxpayers who simply hadn't had their original or amended returns processed, especially paper returns, largely because the IRS was so far backed up that the agency wasn't sure they could do any good. If the IRS can't find the return, it's a little bit problematical about how in the world you know, they can help if nobody knows where the return's at. It's stuck someplace. Well, they had done this, and so they stopped accepting referrals, not just when taxpayers you know, file with the TAS, but also when congressional offices tried to step in. And that's something that you should be aware happens quite regularly. Uh, constituent service is something that most congressmen, senators, you know, it, it's a key part of what they do in their offices. And they usually have staff devoted to this concept where the staff will attempt to uh, intercede, shall we say, on behalf of tax taxpayers who are having issues with various federal agencies for various reasons. And they can't really change the law per se, but they can certainly get attention to something. And that, that's the idea that happens here. Well, the problem became the IRS was so far behind in processing 2020 and 2021 individual returns uh, and amended returns that the TAS came to the conclusion, even for congressional referrals, and this is kind of a big deal, because remember, the Congress is who basically decides how much funding TAS gets, so it's not a good idea to fail to respond to them. 
that they had just said, look, we can't do any good. We got to cut this off. Well, on June the 27th, they have changed the rules. And so now they will accept referrals for 2021 or prior individual or business returns that have not been processed by the IRS. And they will do the same thing for amended returns. You know, where you've sent an amended return for 21 or earlier years, and the IRS is now taking an extraordinary period of time to process a return. So TAS will get involved in those issues when it comes from the congressional offices. They do strongly recommend, though, in the memo, that if a TAS employee, when they take on one of these things, they should really attempt to get a copy of the original return, a signed copy of the original return from the taxpayer. The obvious implication of this is the IRS still probably won't be able to find that return. So if we're going to get any sort of relief on getting something processed, the TAS and the taxpayer may have to come up with a copy of the return that can be processed to move forward. And they do it. They do emphasize this needs to be a copy that is processable with the signatures on it to allow the return to move forward. So that much, as I said, tells you a lot about where the IRS still stands. I suspect the TAS was getting a little nervous about not taking on congressional referrals because, as I said, they kind of control your budget. So you'd prefer to take them on if you could. So they've come up with a methodology to allow them to do that. Now, the big problem we've got for our clients is this right now is limited to congressional referrals. What that means is if your client is in this position, some of the best advice you may be able to give them right now is, look, we can get in front of TAS if you're congressperson or either senator. So remember, everybody generally has three places they could go. Right, You have two senators from the state and you have one congressperson that represents the district. Now, obviously, you got to get the client to figure out who their congressperson is. You know, unless you're in a state that has only one congressperson. So if you're in Wyoming, it's easy. We can give you the, the three. We automatically know who the three are. But if you're in a state even like Arizona, mid-sized state, it's still kind of fun to figure out who the congressperson is especially for anybody that lives here in Phoenix, because, you know, Phoenix gets divided up pretty heavily and there's a lot of districts that get come that come into play here. So you got to find the right one. But the senator is pretty easy and just have them reach out to those offices. I always inform people that don't worry about the political affiliation of the congressperson or senator. Constituent service is something they all get involved in. And I'm blunt. Some offices are much better than others. And just because they don't vote the way you'd like them to vote, uh, don't, don't basically cut off your ability to get some service by you know, just saying, I won't deal with X. It's like, deal with them, right? If they have a staffer that can handle this, you're not dealing with that person. You're dealing with that staffer and you need access to that staffer, which can help you in terms of processing things. I certainly know among my three options I've got here right now, which one of the three I would use, uh, won't actually make a statement because, as I said, it wouldn't really be an endorsement of this person as a congressperson or senator, just more an endorsement that I happen to know that office uh, has tended to come through on occasions when it's been a little more interesting in other cases and you know with other people. So you just kind of figure they, they got good staff. And yes, that could reflect well on the person who got elected, that they know how to choose staff. Could just be pure luck. So we'll go with either. But yeah, watch that. Tell your clients, reach out to their representatives and senators and just, just try to get one of them to take the ball and run with it in order to maybe get TAS involved in their situation. Because there are a lot of these situations out there where taxpayers have been unable to get things moving. The other thing I sometimes use as criteria, if any one of those three is a member of Senate Finance or Ways and Means, if they actually have staff that can move it forward, that is likely to get a little bit more attention from the IRS and Treasury than coming from some random backbencher. Just going to say it that way, right? Random backbenchers are great. They introduce uh, bills, but 
you kind of realize they're not going to get a whole lot of attention compared to somebody who, let's say, especially if they're the ranking member or the chair of Ways and Means or Senate Finance Committee, they they will tend to get a lot more attention. But even run-of-the-mill members there, they also tend to get attention. Next up, we're going to take the case of United States versus Vandemark. Uh, this is a Sixth Circuit appeal of a criminal conviction in the area of tax problems. And this came out on June 30th. It is docket number 21-3470. And it is a little bit unusual because we don't usually talk about criminal tax cases here in this session. But because one of the ways that the appeal went here is that the district court erred by not allowing a directed verdict of innocent to be entered based on the fact that he claims the income in question was never required to be reported. And obviously, if there's not a potentially fraudulent return, then the criminal charge kind of goes away, right? If you weren't trying to defraud the government, then it's a little tough to get convicted of these issues. So that's why we're going to consider this. Now, this is a case of a car dealer, right? It was a car dealership run as an S corporation. Now, the, this car dealership, as the Sixth Circuit panel describes it, was one that sold their cars primarily to lower income individuals who had sketchy credit histories or no credit histories. So, you know, it's one of those type of things to do the structures that way. And they tended to have these people, they couldn't get outside financing. You know, they, they were coming to this uh, supermarket, I guess is what it was called, of cars. They were coming to the, the supermarket primarily to, you know, get their, you know, they, they had, they're going to get financed through them. And generally, not surprisingly, what they ended up doing was signing lease to own agreements. The concept being that the leases, they're generally more favorable, shall we say, to the, um, to the company holding the lease if they're paid because you have to pay a lease off in full. You don't, you don't get to just pay off the principal generally of a lease. Um, you know, you have certain rights and it's easier to take back the car for non-payment. So there are various reasons why you structure it this way. And again, this was a case of the, these people really didn't have any other option, to be honest. Now, what happened was usually when somebody bought a car like this, they would have to give a deposit up front. Yeah, so there, there's a deposit they put in, and they were cash deposits, quite often literally cash deposits, since many of these individuals may also be totally unbanked, so they have no banking relationships whatsoever. So we're getting these deposits to enter into these leases to buy the used car. Now, prior to the year that he ends up getting criminal charges over, uh, these deposits would just go into a standard bank account and be entered into his QuickBooks ledger. So, you know, you start doing it that way. Well, suddenly beginning one year, the owner of the S-Corp directed the employees in the car dealership to instead of, you know, writing this up as a deposit, getting in the bank and giving it to, putting it in QuickBooks, they were to just take these deposits and they were still to write a paper record of the deposit taken from this person. But they were to then just put the cash into a safe. Okay. Now, none of this would be entered into QuickBooks, right? It wouldn't be deposited in the bank. The money in the safe never went to the bank and it would go into the safe. Now, not surprisingly, this uh, person had some things he would like to do with this cash. Not, that's probably not terribly surprising. And one of the things he wanted to do was pay mortgage payments he had due on personal property, including a house that apparently looked like a very big house. Mansion is the way the Sixth Circuit referred to it, but was in the design of a paddle boat. And I've actually, uh, some, somebody on Twitter posted a copy of this that was some, I, I take it, one of the government's evidence items. And yeah, it looks about as tacky as you might expect uh, sitting there. Can you imagine being, being someplace and your neighbor builds a house that looks like a paddle boat next to yours? And it's like, ugh, okay. Anyway, 
But this Patabo's house comes into play because he needs to pay the mortgage on this thing. Now, what he wants to do is take, and what he did do, was take money from the safe and take that down to the bank and use that to pay his mortgage payments. Now, this is where you might say a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing, as well as trying to expand your knowledge, in this case, turned out to be a dangerous thing. He was aware there was some rule about and he should have known this because being a car dealer, in theory, okay, probably the people he dealt with were not going to hand him more than 10 grand at a time. But still, it was always possible, and theoretically, car dealer is one of those who should know this. But he went down and asked a bank employee, just a random bank employee, ask her about, you know, well, you know, if I'm going to be paying in cash, uh, I know that there's a rule that if I pay too much in cash to you, make a payment that's too large, that you have to report this to the IRS. So how much, how much is that? You know, how, how much, at, at what point, you know, are you going to have to report my cash payments to the IRS? Well, the bank employee did answer his question, but it turns out that that wasn't a very smart idea because what he started doing, of course, was making a number of payments because apparently the uh, mortgage, not surprisingly, payment due on this paddle boat mansion uh, was more than $10,000 per month. So he started making multiple cash payments during the month on the mortgage, each one less than 10 grand. Now, as I said, the, the bank employee answered his question, but she also got a little suspicious, not surprisingly. Uh, you know, banks aren't keen on making the front page for being involved in essentially enabling a fill-in-the-blank. You don't know what this guy's doing, but you know he's got cash. And you know he's wanting to avoid having anyone notice he has cash. Could be tax evasion. Uh, could be illegal activities beyond tax evasion. Could be a lot of things. Banks don't like getting involved in that. So she flagged the conversation, let the uh, bank's uh, security people know about, it, including those, you know, the foreign bank, the Bank Secrecy Act experts in the bank aware of this particular issue. Not surprisingly, the bank was a little concerned about this activity. So the bank reported the conversation to... IRS. Okay, well, things are not going well now. At this point, the IRS decides, you know, they, they now they know probably from the bank have discovered the size of the payments being made, the fact there's a lot of cash here. That's here being used to pay something that, of course, the IRS's mind suddenly like, this looks like tax evasion, somebody living, you know, beyond their reported means. Oh, by the way, the other fun part about this is uh, the amount of deposits to the bank account for the S corporations in cash went down dramatically in the year. That's also not a good sign when Harris looks at you. Um, so they decide we need to investigate this guy. Well, CID, the Criminal Investigation Division, IRS Special Agents, got a little bit creative here, as you do when you're trying to figure out what's going on with, you know, things where it appears somebody's trying to hide the fact they got a bunch of cash whether that might be for tax evasion reasons or other reasons, you know, you, you want to kind of get a feel what's happening. So they had an IRS CID agent contact this individual and they were contacting him as a person potentially interested in buying the car dealerships from this guy taking over buying the business. Obviously, this puts this guy in a bad position because, of course, a buyer is going to ask you for, well, I'd like to do it. Can I see your financial statements and tax returns, you know, for the past X years? That's every time I've ever been involved in buying, every time I've had a client who has been looking to buy a business, you know, we always want to see that detail. And you want to see the tax returns because, you, had, you know, you, you want to see something that you could hopefully verify or basically hang them out to dry if it wasn't true. They gave you fake ones uh, where the, uh, they have an incentive not to over-report. 
So, you know, rather than, rather than taking their word for the fact of how profitable they are, you have something to tie it down to. Well, of course, he's got a problem here because it looks like his dealerships have become way less profitable in recent years than they used to be. It just looks like, you know, this whole thing's falling apart. And so that could turn off the buyer. So, of course, what he does, which is what the IRS was hoping he would do, was essentially confessed to the fact that he had a whole lot of off the book uh, sales that weren't going through QuickBooks because wink, wink, you know, all I'm doing is making sure I don't pay more in taxes. You know, I don't want to pay all those taxes to the government. That's horrible. That's terrible. I'm not doing it. Th these are not good things to be telling an IRS special agent. But of course, he doesn't know he's telling an IRS special agent. And so, you know, he runs through the, this whole thing. And he even at one point is caught in the phone conversation as saying, I really shouldn't say these things in public to you. But, you know, he's trying to close the deal because his buyer's getting cold feet because this thing appears to be, you know, it, it fell apart. What happened? So in any event, he does a rather full confession. Now, what's almost certainly other IRS special agents then show up with you know, search warrants and want to question him. And of course, get copies of, you know, the actual QuickBooks they've got, got other details, information, and then they ask him about this. And in fact, specifically ask him, has he been, you know, not reporting income on his tax return? To which he, of course, says, of course, I've reported every dollar. I'm not hiding any funds. I'm a good law-abiding American. Right, who who is paying every dollar of tax, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, does all that issue. So, hey, just what we need. Well, as you might expect, the IRS, knowing what's going on, knowing about the extra set of books, knowing about the fact that safe's there, uh, they eventually uncover all this detail because he gave them the roadmap as to how to get there. Right. So now they've got all of this detail from him. Uh, you know, and all the backup. So it's not only just what he said on the phone, but also now all kinds of additional evidence of what was going on. We have the information from the bank about the cash payments. We have all of these wonderful details to work from and the employees who were told to put the money in the safe and not record it in QuickBooks. So not surprisingly, his trial didn't go very well. So he files now, goes to the Court of Appeals. He, he wants to get his convictions overturned. And you might think, well, this just kind of looks bad. But he did have an interesting argument. So we want to talk about that here. Now, what he argued was that, okay, I know this looks bad, right? I know I know, I know, I know this looks bad. But in reality, these were only deposits. And because they were only deposits, they weren't really income when I received them. And he based that argument on a case that goes back a number of years, uh, which was the case from the Ninth Circuit, as I recall, which was the Indiana Power, the Commissioner versus Indiana Power and Light, uh, which, which was a, actually a U.S. Supreme Court case, where it said essentially that the ta amount is not taxable income unless the taxpayer has some guarantee he or she, or in this case, it, the corporation, would be allowed to keep the money. And he argued that these deposits, well, they're deposits. I don't have a guarantee I get to keep the money because at the end of the lease, I would need to return these deposits to these individuals. Well, the court looked at that, as had the trial court. And the panel came to a conclusion that in reality, in his case, this didn't work. And there are two problems with it. Let, let's talk about the very basic problem, which the panel pointed out. Okay, even, even if we accepted your view that this was not income at the time you received the money, it would clearly be income at the time that somebody completed their contract, finished everything up, and you got to retain the cash. They either completed it so it was a lease to buy and they took title, or they completed it and you kept the money because they went over mileage or whatever other theory you had. That it clearly would have been income at that point. 
And they said, fundamentally, we have found, and the IRS gave us information, about a number of cases in the years in question where you had received the deposit during that time period. And again, during the years in question, it had become clear that you got to keep the money. In essence, it's clear right now there was no, all contingencies went away that could have potentially caused you to lose the money. And you never report that as income. Court said, so clearly this was not the reason you weren't reporting the income. You never planned to report this as income. Secondly, the court said, you're not anywhere close to Indiana Power in your facts. In this case, which may not surprise you if you think about the type of dealership this was, um, the contracts were very heavily rigged in and how he handled them were very carefully rigged in his favor. The contracts themselves didn't say anything about what the mileage limits were. Now, he tried to argue that 12000 was the industry standard, but the court pointed out that there was no evidence they ever used 12,000 miles per year as their excess mileage computation on these. The contracts didn't require that, and he never presented any evidence about th this being what those terms always you know, mean across the industry and you know, would have been enforceable in court as if he tried to go for less than 12000 so saying first, obviously, you just told people at the end of the lease what their excess mileage was. So obviously, you could have just backed into getting to keep it without doing much work. Secondly, also, if, if there was, you know, any damage other than, you know, any damage other than wear and tear, but it was your call entirely, what was considered excess wear and tear or damage other than wear and tear. So you know, they said, and in reality, not surprisingly, you essentially had never paid one of these back out. It's the only case you could show us in recent years of a case where you paid back the deposit was one that was not end of lease due to the mileage, end of lease due to the, you know, excess damage where you didn't take ownership. It appears to be one where for whatever reason, uh, you decided to let somebody back out of the contract shortly after signing. They said, so you didn't even follow the contract on that refund, so it wasn't the terms of the contracts. So the court said, we find no plausible evidence that under the contracts you entered into, there was any real doubt that you were going to keep the cash. As such, it was taxable. And third, I would say, even if he was correct on that, now this is more one for just standard reporting rules or when we talk about the standard civil cases, Obviously, if you've been reporting these deposits as income when received for years, that's a method of accounting. As such, even if you were correct, even if they should not have been recorded, even if you were correct that they should have been held and the amounts picked up at the end of the lease, reality is you would still have needed the IRS's permission to change your method of reporting because it affects the timing. And, you know, we don't have, you know, you never went and did that. So like I said, it was an interesting case from the standpoint of, you know, this whole Indiana power and light theory about when can I hold a deposit off the books and, you know, when there are realistic risks that you're not going to be able to keep the funds. But if you have a situation where everything's rigged to assure that you get to keep the funds, well, the Sixth Circuit here essentially said in that scenario, Indiana power and light would not apply. Okay. Now, obviously, th this was a bad fax, and it really didn't help him that you know he didn't later report the income. This wasn't just deferring the reporting. The court concluded that it was reasonable to conclude he was trying to evade entirely. You know, they said because if that was really your reasoning, you should have reported it when things came clear. Yeah, that's a problem. But it is an interesting case from that point. I also thought it's just great evidence of, yeah, you know, if you're going to defraud the government. Uh, probably not really best to confess, to effectively confess that to employees of the bank that, that you're trying to figure out how to keep the bank from telling the IRS what you're doing. Yeah, it was not the smartest move ever, shall we say. Somewhat less than sharp move. Next up, the case of Eisen versus Commissioner. This is a Fifth Circuit case, docket number 2160679. This was June 29th of 2022. 
Now, this is actually a case from 2017 that the tax court decided that we actually talked about on this program back in 2017. I mean, five years ago, we had discussed this very issue, the Eisen case. Now, one of the key issues is IRC Section 170 F12 mandates certain acknowledgement and documentation requirements for contributions of certain items. And one of the specific things we have documentation issues on relates to aircraft. You know, if, if you make a donation of aircraft, first thing is anything worth more than $500, you have to have any contribution of more than $500. You've got to have, you know, the name and taxpayer identification number of the donor on the acknowledgement uh, for a car. This is for cars and boats, vehicle identification number, a similar number. Uh, and whether it was sold arm's length transactions between unrelated parties or it could be used by the charity in their trade or business. Now, in this case, the problem we have was, and usually we end up reporting this information on Form 1098-C. That is generally how the charity you know, ends up reporting this and you attach this to your return. If you've not seen one of these, you're watching the video I've got on screen, a 1098-C, which is contributions of motor vehicles, boats, and airplanes, which has essentially all the information required for the acknowledgement and allows the, you know, and by doing this, you know, the, the IRS uh, is, a, you know, you attach that and that's proof of giving this on a timely basis. Now, this case is a little weird because the taxpayer was attempting to claim this on an amended return after an exam got going. The taxpayer and the charity had not gone to 1098C. There was not that information. So at this point, the taxpayer starts trying to give other documents to show what happened, right? And they said those documents did at did you know did count as you know should count as substantial compliance. The argue, you know the document said he did have in his hands that. Well, it substantially complies. There's details here. We gave it to the flat plane. They sold it. We have documentation of the sale. We have all of this documentation. Now, here's part of the catch. First thing is, one of the requirements is your documentation has to be contemporaneous. And some of these things have been created after the facts. So that's a problem as well as the court points out. The law and you can check the law. It's in the uh, article that's in our PDF this week. Uh, specifically requires you to have a taxpayer ID number on it. And that's written into the Internal Revenue Code. That's not some IRS requirements. That's a requirement Congress wrote literally into the law. In fact, most of the charitable documentation requirements, a good chunk of them are not regulatory requirements. Now, some details like what's a qualified appraisal and what actually has to be in that, there are some details of that that, yes, are defined in regs. But most of the requirements are actually things written by Congress into the law. Now, the taxpayer said, hey, look, clearly I gave this contribution. I've got all this documentation. I have substantially complied with the law and substantial compliance should be enough. But the Fifth Circuit, sustaining the tax court, said, gang, uh, substantial compliance cannot be used when you have failed to meet a requirement that Congress put in the law. And I should probably add a caveat here. Unless Congress itself writes in a special rule that would allow for substantial compliance. When Congress writes requirements into the law, you have to follow those. In the case of the documentation requirements here, that we have for charitable contributions. And that would apply not just to if you're giving an airplane, but just a simple $500 documentation. And we've talked about this earlier. You know, a few weeks back, we talked about the same problem of not having the contemporaneous documentation, not having it in the form necessary. As the court says here, you cannot argue for substantial compliance when you're failing to comply with the requirement Congress outlined specifically in the statute. Black letter law must be followed. Unless Congress provides an out, which they have not in the charitable realm, failing to follow the black letter law 
will allow a pure denial and the courts have no authority to change that result. Now, I say that because a whole lot of people are going to say that, you know, well, I've been through 20 exams, you know, on this issue and we presented this stuff and the IRS has never questioned. That's fine. Because what I tell people is there are two things you need to know in tax practice. One of them is, you know, as a practical matter, what exactly works. In an exam, I'm not going to volunteer. If the agent's not pushing me on the concept of the fact that this needs to be contemporaneous information and we can get a current letter from the charity, I'm certainly going to offer it. And it might be good for me to know if that seems to be something that agents in the area are accepting. But that by itself is not enough because I need to warn the client about what the service can do. And in this case, they clearly can. For any, any deficiency of documentation compared to what the code has in Section 170, any such deficiency... I have to tell the client that if the agent denies this, you know, maybe we could talk an appellate conferee out of it, but I will put straight up, the case law is horrendous on this. So the odds of you carrying the case law and getting this overridden is frankly very, very low, especially if you're in the Fifth or Ninth Circuit, where both have prior case law with reported cases that have said frankly straight up that you cannot use substantial compliance to overcome statutory requirements. So you need to understand not just, you know, a lot of people tell me, well, this isn't practical advice because they don't enforce it. It's practical advice because they can enforce it. And that's something you need to know because I've been around long enough now, I've been in practice since 82. I have seen the IRS change from time to time and suddenly start enforcing things that maybe for years up to there, they had simply ignored or hadn't paid attention to on exam. So it's important that you warn your client and not just tell clients, I don't worry about this. The IRS never enforces this. It's not a problem. That's how you might get yourself into a malpractice situation if you're not careful because the client's going to claim that rightfully in some cases, that you told them, don't worry about any of this stuff. It doesn't matter. They never question it. When you tell me never question it, you're saying they never have questioned it and you're giving assurance they never will. And that second one is assurance you simply cannot give. This has been the current federal tax developments for the week of July 5th as we enter the second half of 2022. Where'd that first half go, right? We got it. We now got in the second half of 22. Uh, again, if you have any questions, you can email me, edzollerscurrentfulltaxdevelopments.com. You can also get me online. Uh, I am on the uh, Connect sites for Arizona, New Jersey, Minnesota, Illinois. When you look at Washington, also check in on Idaho's discussion group. So if you have any issues, you can post there. I'll see you about responding uh, as well. We'll be back here next week because I'm sure we'll have something else happening in the week. We'll see what goes on as we get past the 4th of July and off into just the month of July. Again, we might see something from Congress this month. Uh, not a lot of time for them to work on something, but possible. You know, will we see it? That's up in the air, but it's, you know, it's always possible. So keep your eye on what they're doing. We know we got the pension bill in play. We know we got the question about the R&D expensing versus amortization. And is there something can attach that to? as well as the original reconciliation bill that initially held the Build Back Better Act, you know, will that finally pass? Will they get something that the Democrats can agree upon? Because again, that only needs Democratic votes to go through. So my guess is it will be used for something. The question will be, what is that something? So, you know, we'll be back next week, tell you what we know, if anything, about anything that comes up. And if nothing else, see what the developments are during the week here as we go through one more week of current federal tax developments.